Hi, everybody. This is Betsy Wurzel, your host of Chatting with Betsy on Passionate Rule Talk Radio, where our mantra is to educate, enlighten, and entertain. Folks, I have a phenomenal guest on with me today. I'm so excited. With me today is Tara Eisen, who is a professor currently at Arizona State University, where she teaches fiction. She is a writer and author of several books, but she's going to discuss her book today, which is a masterpiece. Now, I'm not a book critic by any means, but in my humble opinion, this book is a masterpiece and needs to be read. The name of the book is At the Hour Between Dog and Wolf, a novel by Tara Eisen. Welcome, Tara, to Chatting with Betsy. Hi, Betsy. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, you are welcome. It is my pleasure. I have to tell you, thank you for writing this book. And as a (laughs) Jewish woman, (laughs) I want to thank you. It really touched my heart. Um, And I would love to see it be made into a movie. I really would. It's very. That would be great. Well, as a a a... sister Jewish woman, thank you for (laughs) reading it and for your kind words. Oh, you're welcome. I have to tell you a little funny story. I was worried I wasn't going to get the book in time to read it, but I did. And I read it very quickly because I couldn't put it down. Uh, I have to ask you, what motivated you to write such a powerful uh, novel? Mm. Uh, Well, it started with my stepmother, actually. My stepmother was a hidden child in World War II. Um, she was a little five-year-old girl, Jewish girl in Hungary, and at the beginning of the war, her mother took her to, out to the countryside to live on a farm with a Catholic family, and she doesn't remember much of the experience. Uh, you know, she was only five years old, um, uh, and at the end of the war, her mother was able to come back and found her. They emigrated to the United States. But she does remember, even at the age of five, she remembers being given a new name and taught the Catholic prayers, and she remembers being told, don't ever, ever cry. And, you know, that is so haunting to me for a five-year-old girl to be taught that, you know, to be told that. And I think that trauma stayed with my stepmother the rest of her life. Um, So... I was fascinated by this idea of, you know, how do you take a, a vulnerable mind and put them in a situation where the stakes are so high and force them into living such a lie, force them to take on this new identity before they even know who they are. And so that was the inspiration for the story. It is not my stepmother's story, however. I, I always want to be really clear about that. Um, and my character is much older. She's 12 when the novel starts, and I decided to set it in France rather than in Hungary. But my stepmother really was the inspiration for the novel. That is incredible. I have to ask you, how long did it take for you to write this book? Because I know you did a lot of research. Yeah. I, oh, I did. I have been working on this book for about 25 years. This wow. has really been a labor of love. I would work on it for a few years, put it down, write a different book, come back to it. Um, and yes, it required so much research. I, I thought, I, you know, I went into it, <clears throat> excuse me, with just sort of a, a, a lay person's knowledge of World War II or, a, a, you know, maybe a Jewish person's uh, lay person's knowledge of World War II. And I had just this sort of vague idea of, Oh, yes, the French, the Vichy government collaborated with Germany. Yes, I know about that. But my research was just an extraordinary process, a really deep dive into World War II, into the German occupation of France and the Vichy government, into Judaism, into Catholicism, because my my character ultimately uh, rejects Judaism and becomes a devout Catholic. Um, but also a lot of research into the experience of hidden children. You know, we're talking thousands and thousands of of children. Um, And no two stories are the same. Everybody has a different story. My story is fictional, but um, I wanted to honor the experience of someone who who went through this kind of thing. 
Um, and so I really wanted, I did a lot of research. I wanted to get the details right. Yes, it's a fictional story, but I'm sure this happened to mm. some young girl in France and, and all over uh, that Jewish children were hidden, given different identities and Absolutely. told, you know, um, not to say that they were uh, Jewish yeah. Yeah. Um, at all. And I, there were definitely, there were definitely stories of, which, you know, it depends on the age of the child, et cetera, et cetera. But there were heartbreaking stories of children who went into hiding at a very young age, survived the war, and when their parents, if the parents were fortunate enough to survive the war, came to get their children, the children didn't recognize them, didn't know who they were. So, you know, they had Tara, I'm having trouble and hearing you. Are, are you wearing earplugs, a headset? Uh, I am. I can. No problem. I can. Uh, yeah. You're cutting out. Well, That's I'm what I want. Sure. Oh, sorry. Is it better? That's better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, there were many stories of children who uh, owned it with the people who were hiding them. And they didn't know their parents. And their parents, I know their first children who survived the war, came Yep, the end. children uh, rejected them, didn't, didn't know them. Really heartbreaking. Yes. Yes, it, it is very uh, heartbreaking. And you see the transformation of Danielle, who becomes Marie John, if I'm saying that correctly, the French way. Um, yes. Just, yes. Uh, you know, powerful how this, and I don't want to give all of the story away, folks, because I really want, people to read this book, but the transformation of characters of Danielle become a Marie John of her, the family that she lives with, the young boy and his transformation, which is a total twist and I'm not giving it away. So you have to read the book. Um, it's, I mean, I can't even imagine living in constant fear and what does, that does mm -hmm. to you. Um, as a yeah. child, you know, being told, yeah. you know, not to cry, not to make a mistake, don't talk too much yeah. to people, um, and losing your whole identity, and then having to refine your identity all over again. Mm. Yeah, that that was really what I was interested in was this sort of psychological transformation. I, I mean, you're exactly right. My, my character, who's 12, is told, if you make a mistake, you know, here's this new identity. You have to pretend to be this new person. And if you make a mistake, the police will come kill all of us. And she's terrified. You know, she's a child. She's terrified. And I was really interested in how, you know, someone who is living day to day, minute to minute, in such a state of fear, and the tiny, tiny little steps they take, the, the decisions they make, the choices they make that initially seem so harmless and, and benign. And they think they are making the right choices in order to keep, uh, she, or she does, I'll speak about my character, to keep herself safe, but then also to keep her family to sa safe, to keep her village safe, to keep her entire country safe. And that takes her down a very dark path. And I think we all want to believe or feel that that wouldn't happen to us. You know, that in a, in a situation of such duress, we would make the moral choices. We would be noble. We would be honorable. But when you are terrified or hungry, cold, when you're child is hungry or has a gun at their head or your family, you know, I think we are all more vulnerable to some really dangerous influences than we would like to admit. And, and that's, that's what I was really interested in is how these influences of, of fascist, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, racist, how those ideologies can get under somebody's skin and, and get a hold of somebody. 
um, yes. to, you know, a really, really unfortunate, terrible result. Yes, and how ironic, Tara, that as this book uh, came out, mm-hmm. that anti-Semitism is on the rise. And you know, that was never my intention. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, when I started writing this book, I really was just interested in the psychology of, of that transformation. But in recent years, wow, wow, I, I'm, you know, we're reliving it all over again. I'm seeing in headlines and on television and online the kind of propaganda and misinformation and, uh, um, you know, <laughs> manipulation, um, indoctrination of anti-Semitic and fascist ideologies all over again. And as you're saying, yeah. the, the rise of it, the, the resurgence of it is so disturbing. So even though technically this novel takes place in World War II, uh, it's, it's rather disturbingly relevant, I think. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, and uh, before I forget, because sometimes I'm so excited to talk to someone, my mouth goes <laughs> ahead of my brain. <laughs> uh, the title of your book is very interesting. How did you come up with the title at the hour between dog and wolf? Yeah, it's, it's um, somewhere in my research, and I actually don't remember what I was reading or when this happened, but somewhere in my research, I came upon a French idiomatic expression, entre chien et loup, which means between dog and wolf. And it's an idiomatic expression for twilight or dusk. And when I read that, it just sort of clicked in my head. I loved the sound of it. I I loved the poetry of it. But I also felt it really captured that idea of transformation and how, how subtle it is. There's a moment in the book where Danielle is remembering uh, before the war uh, or the early days of the war, taking a walk in Paris with her father. And he po- it's, it's uh, sundown and he points to the sky and he says, you know, okay, we're, we're on Fushien et Lou at this hour. So you look at the sky and you tell me the exact moment when the day changes to the night. And of course she can't because there is no one specific moment. It's a, a series of very subtle shadings you know, from day to night, from goodness to evil, from light to darkness. And that, I felt, really represented the, the journey that my character goes on in the novel. Yes, a definite transformation, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, for sure. It was really like, it, it almost, and you, you can't put fault on the character because she's doing what she thinks is right to survive and to protect yes, the family yes. that she's living with. So when the uh, Jews started wearing the gold star in their coat, she's like, mm. well, you know, nothing wrong with that. We wear crosses, you know, oh, so I'm, I can't. I, I'm so glad you, know. you brought that moment up. That is that's one of my, I mean, it feels awkward to say that's one of my favorite moments in the novel. But, but yeah, that happens in a moment where, you know, we're more than halfway through the novel, and Danielle has, uh, transformed into Marie Jean, good Catholic girl. She represses her Jewish identity, her Jewish faith. She really believes at this point that, that she is Marie Jean. And um, it's at a point in the war where the Jews in the southern zone of France, they weren't initially uh, required to wear the Jewish star, but they, you know, it's changed and now they, they have to wear the Jewish star. And that's exactly what Marie Jean says in a letter to someone. I, you know, I don't see what the big deal is. It's, you know, first of all, so many of them look like regular people. So yeah. wearing the star is good because then, we, you know, we can know who they are. But why would they mind? Because it's a sign of their faith, right? They should be proud to wear the yellow star like a good Christian person wears a crucifix. Um, and at this point, she's wearing a crucifix around her neck. And that, that sort of willful ignorance uh, you know, at this era, you put a Jewish, uh, a yellow star on, you're marking yourself for death. And she doesn't want to believe that. She doesn't want to see that. She wants to believe that uh, none of this is such a big deal. None of this, you know, is, is, is that dangerous. That's the only way she can survive, 
is by convincing herself of that. Yes, and she becomes friends with a, mm-hmm. a girl and yeah. um, who has turned out, I don't want to give the whole story away, but she was also a Jewish girl but from another country. And, you mm-hmm. know, when I read your book, Tara, and as a Jewish person, I can never understand, and I still don't understand, why Jews were never accepted in Europe or anywhere. Why is it like someone who's Polish could say, even though they're Catholic or they could be Protestant, oh, well, I'm Polish. But a Jewish person, that you're a yeah. Jew. You're not Polish. You're a Jew. Or you're not French. You're I, a Jew. Yeah. And I could never figure that out. Did I, you I have no across? answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I no just answer for don't you. get I it. I really don't. But I think everyone identifies differently. I, I mean, you know, if we're talking about during the war, there were Jews in Germany who felt that their identity as Germans was every bit as integral to who they were as their Judaism. Same thing in, in France. There were, you know, Jews in, in France who felt you know, yes, I'm Jewish, but I am also French. And wanting, you know, the feeling that that made them safe, that, 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 that they were never going to be persecuted for being Jewish because of their national identity. And, you know, we all know uh, it doesn't work that way. Exactly right. I, I have to say... Um, and it's just a coincidence, while reading your book um, at Pastor World Talk Radio, we started a show, Lest We Forget, and we were covering World War II and um, the Holocaust. And mm-hmm. it blew my mind, the research about Hitler and mm-hmm. how he copied some of the stuff that the United States was doing to the immigrants <sighs> here. And he just modified it to his twisted mind. But um, it it was just uh, mind-blowing. And as a young girl, I had to watch films of the Holocaust. Mm. And I grew up, my dad was a World War II veteran. He had faced anti-Semitism. He was from Newark, Mm. New Jersey. Uh, my mom from the Bronx never experienced anti-Semitism until so she came to New Jersey. <sighs> That's where I live. Wow. And wow. Uh, when, we lived in a, a mixed, when I say mixed, Catholic neighborhood, Catholic church school down the block from us. And one mm-hmm. of the neighbors said to my mother, Harriet, if Tommy comes over and stares at you, it's because he was taught the Jews have horns growing out of their heads. <gasps> Oh, Can wow. you imagine? This is in the wow. 60s, folks. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's frightening now to see anti-Semitism. And, you know, everyone looks for scapegoat. But I want to yeah. put it in perspective for the audience, Tara, that because the young generation doesn't understand, and it's hard yeah. to fathom being petrified every second of your life that someone will discover you're Jewish and that you could get killed and the family that's helping you could get killed. Yeah. And I, um, what, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think that I, I mean, growing up, I grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles where I felt like maybe half of the people in my life were Jewish and half of them were Gentile. And growing up, I thought, that, I thought that was the world. I thought that represented the world, that half the world was Jewish, half the world was Gentile. I probably was, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 before I realized that that wasn't the case. And I, I was very complacent uh, as, a, as a Jewish woman. Uh, my mother was Jewish, my father was not, but we, we also lived a very, very secular life. We, we weren't observant. Um, and I was very indifferent about my Judaism. I knew about the Holocaust, you know, but that was ancient history. And I don't feel that I ever was 
a victim or exposed to any direct anti-Semitism growing up. Maybe it was there and I didn't realize it. But when I wrote this novel, I, it, I, don't, you know, I can't say it made me a better Jew, but it, it made me more aware of my privilege, how I have been able to go my entire life without my Jewish identity being a threat, being, a, being you know, dangerous. Um, and I, I think it almost took working on this novel for 25 years for me to really understand what is at stake in being a Jewish woman, in being Jewish. Um, I, you know, it was, it was eye-opening. Um, this isn't ancient history. Uh, it's not even yes. history. It's happening today. And, uh, yeah. Yes, definitely, uh, for sure. I, my next-door neighbors were very anti-Semitic, uh, called us names. A couple of boys would call me names on the way to school. <laughs> Oh. And um, I talk about irony. Ironically, one of the boys that called me names ended up um, my cousin, my first cousin, married his cousin. And so oh, wow. when my my cousin's husband said, um, "Do you know so and so?" and I said, "Yeah, they used to call me all these names." And we went over to their house, and he said, "Don't you ever say anything to her again." <gasps> about being oh, Jewish. Oh, wow. Oh, um, wow. So it's a small world, but uh, wow. and my house, my parents' house was graffitied, thankfully only in shaving cream, by children who played in our backyard. These are kids that played in our backyard. Oh. Nobody was turned away my, from our backyard. We had the biggest backyard in, in the block, um, and they do this. And I've, I've seen hatred. Um, my grandparents, my mother's parents, fled Europe during World War I, which mm. I thought they did it before, but they did it during World War I. And uh, stories are uh, just incredible. But the transformation, I, I they asked this with Marie, uh, Danielle being Marie Jean, um, how do you think she turned out after mm. the war. <laughs> I don't want to give away the end, but yeah, how do you yeah. think in your mind? I Finding the, the right place for her to land at the end of the novel, you know, it was, was actually very challenging because I wanted to get her to a place of self-reckoning where, you know, I wanted to open the door just a little bit to a different kind of self-awareness or insight or self-reckoning. But I couldn't take her too far down that path because it would have felt very false to me. Um, unless I jumped forward in time, and I, I didn't want to do that. So I had to get her to a place where she realizes that Danielle, the girl she once was, is gone forever. She's never coming back. But also that Marie Jean, this girl that she has become, can't exist any longer either. She can't be that person either. But then who is she? And for her to realize she is going to have to reconstruct an entire identity. She's going to have to figure out who she's going to be in the world moving forward. And she has no idea how to do that. She just knows she, she's going to have to. She's going to have to start with a, you know, a first step, no matter how small it is. Um, where she goes from there, I don't know. I honestly don't. Um, I'd like to think and hope she continues down that path of uh, greater awareness, self-awareness, um, you know, getting back in touch with uh, her humanity and her understanding of the world. You know, she's only, she's about 16, almost 16 when the novel ends. So she's got a lot of time to figure this out. But um, I'd like to think she grows into a better person. Yes. Yes, I, yeah. I would uh, hope so, too, uh, for the character. I have to ask, because I'm curious, uh, why did you choose France? Mm. I, I, you know, my, so my, my stepmother 
excuse me, but this was in Hungary, and I knew nothing about Hungary. I knew I wasn't going to set it there. Initially, my choice to set it in France was actually rather, uh, not arbitrary, but, but sort of casual in that I felt more familiar with French culture. I had lived there for a year as a student. Um, I'd been going to France uh, many times over my life. Loved Fr- I love France. I love France. I love the culture. I love the people. I love the history. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just set it in France. And, again, I had this very cursory knowledge of, or, or you know, oh, yes, Vichy, the Vichy government collaborated with the Nazis. Okay, well, that'll be interesting. But it wasn't until I started the research, and I, I understood that not only did Vichy collaborate with the Nazis, they did it so enthusiastically. They did it so eagerly. Um, I didn't understand really what was going on. And so what France goes through as a country, this sort of split of identity, and this, this, again, need to sort of have to reconstruct a French identity, is what Danielle, my character, is going through on a, on a smaller level. I think the story of what is go- happening in France and the story of what happens to my character, I think they mirror each other a little bit. I, I had no idea how, how critical the French experience would be to this novel. I, I can't imagine it being set anywhere else. Um, and well, you've already alluded to this, the, the anti-Semitism in France. I mean, I'd, I'd heard there was uh, an undercurrent or a vein of anti-Semitism in French culture, French history. I, I've been going to France since I was 12 years old. I didn't feel I had ever experienced it. But I didn't realize how when the Vichy government agreed to collaborate with the Nazis, including the anti-Semitic policies, which in the early days of the occupation, the French policies were even more extreme, were, were, were more punitively anti-Semitic than the German policies or, or than, than the policies that the Germans wanted the French to enact. And I, um, I, I was really disturbed <laughs> to discover that, but it was... It, to see how the Vichy government allowed what perhaps was an undercurrent of anti-Semitism to rise to the surface and flourish in French culture. And again, we're seeing that in the world today, um, where you know, anti-Semitism has now been encouraged, and people are saying the quiet part out loud. And again, you know, have we learned nothing? That's, that's very disturbing. Yes, yes, it is. Um, there was an incident here in New Jersey um, recently about um, with anti-Semitism. Uh, mm-hmm. I think with a bomb scare or bomb actually being thrown. Um, <sighs> it's very scary. You have a quote in the beginning of your book, Tara. I won't even attempt to announce the person's name. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> but the, the quote is, to do evil... A human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good. That's powerful. It's Alexander. I, I can't pronounce the last name. Um, I'll, I'm going to mispronounce it also, but it's Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, Soviet okay. dissident. Yeah, um, and that was another one of those things that when I when I came across that quotation, it it really resonated for me. It was like, yep, yep, that's that's what's happening here, and I I believe that. I believe there are very few angels and demons in the world. I, I think we're all on the spectrum of, you know, good right. and evil, and we're, we're all just trying to do our best, right? Um, but I think that a lot of I, – I think part of the genius of fascist ideology is how it can convince people that, you know, if you follow us, you, you know, you, you'll be safe, your people will be safe, your country will be safe, we'll be stronger, it's for the, the greater good. Um, and I, I think that that ability to rationalize, I mean, the, the earlier story that we talked about when Marie Jeanne is able to sort of rationalize for herself, well, it's not that big a deal if Jewish people have to wear the star. You know, uh, it's a good thing for us to be able to know who they are because, after all, those people are different. 
And they should be proud. It's a sign of their faith. You know, how she's able to twist that and rationalize that into feeling that not only is it, <laughs> it's not only, it's, it's, not a, it's not a death sentence, that it's, it's benign, that it's actually even for the greater good for everybody, including the Jews, um, that's very disturbing to me. I, I yeah. really had to get into the mindset of how somebody who is leaning toward fascist, xenophobic, racist, anti-Semitic ideologies how they are able to believe that these ideologies are good, that they are for the, the betterment of humanity. Um, and that was a dangerous, that was a very disturbing place to be. But I think that for most people, they, we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to believe that what we're doing, I mean, you know, who wants to believe that what you're doing is evil? You want to believe that what you're doing is for the good of someone, at least, um, right. And yeah, yeah. I did. I think, I, I mean, you know, people wonder, well, how did people, you know, um, follow Hitler and the, all the anti-Semitic, um, delusions, I want to call them. Um, when you, when a leader or people in government start dehumanizing people, of whatever race they are. Mm-hmm. And then you, when you start thinking of a person as vermin, of a rat, mm-hmm. a low, you know, subhuman, yeah. then you think, yeah. oh, well, we're doing society a favor by getting rid of these yeah. people. Um, yeah. And it's just the dehumanizing of, of a other of race. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, back and it starts, then. It small. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, if you were quarter Jewish, folks, you were in the ghetto mm-hmm. or you were rounded mm-hmm. up. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's and really it, it starts, um, it starts, scary. It starts small. It starts with the othering. You know, they get, I mean, you know, it, to, to get to those people are vermin, very often it can start with, well, those people are different. And right. one of the characters who I, I find in a way very uh, uncomfortable in the novel is, her name is Bert, and she's the woman who takes Danielle into her, her home and is supposed to pretend to be Danielle's uh, Catholic aunt. Um, and when Danielle comes to this home, there's the 15-year-old boy, Luke, who is blatantly, virulently anti-Semitic. Uh, you know, he hates Jews from the beginning. But Bert, his mother is more of the, now, you know, if he says something anti-Semitic, she talks to him. And then, you know, that's not nice. That's not nice. Remember, we are all just children. Um, but we want all of us to love each other. But, you know, but, and, you know, of course, those people are different, but they are very different members of the world. And that kind of benign anti feminism where she feels that a Christian virtue to give us a sort of we're all sisters. We're all sisters. No. But we have to talk to them. Of course, there's a difference. And it's in for the transformation with Luke. Um, and I, again, I want to give the story away, is just, that's a twist. Folks, you have to read this book. It is uh, <laughs> phenomenal. The whole, all the characters, how they, what they go through, how they change. Um, it's a fictional story, but it, it happened. It, it happened, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's yeah. just um, amazing to read. And Tara Eisen, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I, again, I thank you for, for writing this book, um, powerful uh, book. Um, my son you. read it. I, I really appreciate and, it. Yeah. <laughs> and he really, um, well, Josh is a cognitive disability. I don't know what he got from the book, but he, he liked it. He did. He, he liked the book. And, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Josh knows that he's Jewish. Uh, my husband wasn't Jewish. But my husband loved the Jewish mm. people. 
And um, thank you for writing this book. And I can't wait to see what you write next. (laughs) Thank you. I I so appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk about it with you, Betsy. Thank you again. Uh, you're you're welcome. It is my pleasure, folks. Oh, Tara, before I forget, where can people yeah. reach you? Oh, anywhere. I'm very findable. Uh, I my website is just my name, so it's taraison.com. I am on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as Tara Eisen Writer. Um, I love hearing from people. So you know, if anybody listening gets a chance to read the book and has questions or um, I, you know, please reach out. I'm, I'm very easy to find. And where can they purchase your book? Anywhere. Uh, yeah, certainly it's up on Amazon. Um, I, I encourage people to support their local independent bookstore if you're fortunate enough to have one. If they don't have it, please ask them to order it. Um, also the local library. I, you know, the God bless libraries. And If it's not at your local library, please ask the librarian to order it. They'll be happy to do so, and it won't cost anything. So uh, it's out there, yeah. Well, thank you again, uh, Tara Eisen, for coming on. Thank you, everyone, for listening. The information about Tara Eisen will be in the blog that Jeannie White, who's station manager, writes and produces the show. Thank you, Jeannie. And to thank you to Lillian Caldwell, CEO of Passion World Talk Radio, who makes this all possible. And thank you for listening. Please share this show. Johnny with Betsy is free to subscribe to on iHeart, Spreaker, Spotify, and YouTube, to name a few. I have phenomenal guests from all walks of life. You never know who I'm going to interview or what my topic will be. I like to be a little mysterious. So please subscribe. And tell your friends about Chatting with Betsy. And please uh, leave a review. My mission is to help people, and that's why I'm here. And I like to have people on that have a passion for what they do and are here to, to help others. And I'll tell you what, as a Jewish person, I was blown away by this book. Blown away. Um, Thank you. Phenomenal book. Um, I can't say enough about it, Tara. <laughs> it, it, it touched me, and I have to be honest, because I, I did have nightmares when I would watch the movies about the Holocaust uh, when I was young. I did have nightmares, but you know what? Um, I'm a sensitive person. <laughs> but read the book. <laughs> it's, I think it should be a part of history, social studies, curriculum. Mm. That's how strongly I feel about it. Uh, You're welcome. So folks, get this book at the hour between dog and wolf, a novel by Tara Eisen. And as I always, which is available on amazon.com and wherever books are sold. And as I always say at the end of my show and how important it is for now in the world where you could be anything, please be kind and shine your light Mm. bright. Because if we all did that, it would be a much kinder, brighter world, and we sure need it today uh, in today's yeah. world. And, um, you know, yeah. I'm a product of the yeah. 60s and 70s. We're all more alike than we are uh, not alike. And yeah. just show love to your fellow man. You know, we all want the same things uh, in life. Yeah. We want um out to be safe. We want love, shelter, food, kindness. Let's show love to our fellow human beings. And uh, that's what I believe. So until we chat again, this is Betsy Wurzel, your host of Chatting with Betsy. Bye-bye now.